Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. Today on our show, we're, first my dad is going to present to you different access types, and then after that we're going to talk about the controversies surrounding each of the different types. But first, I know what I did this weekend, and you probably did the same, was watch a lot of sports. Yes, And yes, it indeed. was quite an international event. We watched American football, and I know a lot of you are huge football fans, but that we watched American football. And we do have my kids play soccer and tennis and, and my niece and nephews do. So definitely we do care about more sports than just is what is right here. But this is just a little represent, representation of what we're going to talk about. Well, why did we show these? Why? We chose these out of all the others. <laughs> this is what we had that we could come up with on short notice. Well, so, or maybe it's the ones I played. Right. So we watched American football that took place in London. There was UFC fights in Melbourne, Australia for the middleweight title. Um, baseball playoffs started, and that's quite an international sport. So the reason we want to talk about sports is because there are we see a lot of similarities between playing sports and practicing endodontics and even living your life. Like, why don't you tell us a little bit about how this is similar? Well, I grew up playing these three sports. That's why they're featured. Uh, not to be rude, we just didn't have the others. But anyway, um, having played these three sports and these two the most, uh, there was teams. And I noticed as a kid growing up that teamwork uh, is what uh, really fuels societies. It's the teamwork that fuels uh, civilizations and countries. It's the, uh, it's the fuel that drives us towards success. So teams come together, like in our practices. And in our practices, you've got to get the right receptionist. We've got to get the right assistants around us. We have to get the right hygienist. Um, we do use a hygienist in the Indo office to give anesthesia and to do other kinds of things that are important. Uh, you have the whole personnel, the whole team, and the team has to click as one. There has to be common goals. There has to be uh, measurable uh, ways to assess performance. And we can't just hope we get better. Uh, we and can't, chemistry working together as well. you got to have chemistry. And just like in teams, sports, you see players get injured, they go. You see them get cut, they get traded. Uh, we do that in our offices, don't we? We sometimes don't always hire the right person. We find out, regrettably, a little bit later that we don't have a person that might be a really good person, but they just might not fit in our organization and our goals. So yeah, we got to have the right team and the right chemistry. Like so often, we we hear of teams that are doing badly, and they're kind of the announcers are kind of wondering what's wrong because they're they're all good players, but they just can't work together. You know, that happens in endodontics. Uh, a lot of times we have pretty good people around us, like I'm an endodontist, so I can hire a great assistant from a restorative practice, but they don't know anything about endo. So I've always tried to hire people uh, at airports, walking into a store, a restaurant. If I see a fabulous person and their uh, interaction with people is impeccable and they're kind and they're polite and they're fun and they're interesting, I give them my card. I say, if you're ever looking for work, you know, you'd be calling me first, right? So anyway, teamwork is good. Now we got to talk a little bit about practice because we can have teams that uh, in sports that need to get better. And in our practices, we always need to get better. So we got to really focus on training, training, training. Perfect practice makes perfect play. So that's an important thing. A lot of times probably you develop a strategy at the beginning of the day, maybe. You get like with your assistance, but then stuff happens and maybe you have to adapt? Yeah, um, I think she's getting to the very heart of it. Uh, in endodontics, it's called emergencies, and oftentimes your day starts off beautifully, it's perfectly set up, but you know what? The phone rings, and when the phone rings, uh, Dr. A has an emergency that needs to be seen right now. Uh, 20 minutes later, uh, somebody lost a crown, they have problems with hot and cold and blah, blah, blah. So teams have to adjust during the game and offices and the team in the office has to adjust constantly to the changing environment. And like, what about execution? I know I had some opinions over the weekend about how things were executed, thinking that they could be a lot better. Like I know as a, as a fan, I expect flawless execution. 
Flawless execution, very interesting. Can I tell a short story? Go ahead. Okay, so I was at Miramar Base in San Diego. It's where they uh, shot Top Gun. And uh, I snuck away from the group and I was invited with Phyllis to come into the officers club and eat with the officers. And when I say officers, these are like 23, 24 year old kids and they're flying F-22s, F-18s. They're landing on aircraft carriers. They can release a nuclear weapon. Ugh. And I want to know all about what happens in the cockpit, but I finally had the courage to say, well, you guys, this mantra, it's on the wall, it's everywhere, flawless execution. Do you guys never make mistakes? And this guy looked at me and he goes, we make lots of mistakes, but flawless execution isn't about not making mistakes. It's about solving problems as they occur. Just like an endo, you can't find the canal, you gotta adjust, you gotta move the axial wall a little bit. You break an instrument, ah, ultrasonics, treffin procedure, pop goes the weasel, out comes the file. So there's different things we can do that uh, overcome these upsets that are normal. So upsets aren't good or bad, they are, and I think how the team learns to handle those upsets is what's gonna drive them to greater success. That's, that's interesting. I also think that, um, something sorry like i i'm thinking that it's one thing i notice is that there's a lot of controversies in sports just like there's a lot of controversies in endodontics and we're going to be actually talking about one of those controversies today but in sports i know there's some things about um women and men getting the same pay oh. right now we're getting our basketball season started in the united states and there's supposed to be exhibition games in china and there's controversy going on there because someone in the U.S. said something that the Chinese were offended by. So, yeah, there's controversies. There's always controversies, and controversies, like everything else, uh, they just need to be managed. Uh, the team needs to stay together. They need to openly be able to disagree and put forth different ideas in ways that could be a, a common solution that we could all embrace. But uh, yeah, don't, don't try to dodge controversies. Just try to get a great team. And it's like the Air Force, you know, you'll be solving problems as they occur. Okay, well, let's get started with our show. And in case you didn't see the connection between sports and dentistry, um, right here on this bat, you see it says Dr. Clifford J. Ruddle. So this kind of ties it all together for us. So let's get started with the show. <laughs> Before we get into access cavities, just a few things to comment on that are actually going to directly influence future treatment. In other words, access is going to dictate a lot of the downstream steps. As an example, when we talk about the endodontic triad, we're talking about shaping canals. Of course, shaping canals means finding the orifices, negotiating skillfully and masterfully to the full working length. Then those secured canals can be shaped. We shape canals to hold a reservoir of reagent. And this reagent can work into all kinds of fun anatomy. And we can actually see multiple apical portals of exit cleaned where our files never reached. And of course, we want to use a three-dimensional obturation system because well-shaped canals become clean root canal systems and root canal systems can be filled in all their dimensions. So that's a little bit about why we want to look at access today because access is really going to influence all those steps. So when we spin this tooth, you get to see it in a little bit more of its anatomical three-dimensionality. And what that means is you can begin to see how different kinds of access patterns are going to influence maybe furcation and the concavities we see between roots. Uh, we can also understand access cavities are going to uh, influence directly tough anatomical challenges that we'll talk about in just a little bit. And so a little bit about access then to take it to the clinic and look at some actual cases where everything's been accessed, you can see the shapes are appropriate for the roots that hold them. Shape canals allow us to fill root canal systems. We can get multiple apical portals of exit. We can see a lot of anastomosing in there. And then of course the palatal roots resected, but you can see the MB root has a third system with its own portal of exit, furcal canals, multiple apical support. Hey, this is endodontics. This is why we have so much fun doing endodontics because if they were just simple little canals, it wouldn't be that much fun, but they're called systems. So today we're gonna to talk about how to treat root canal systems. You can see lots of wild anatomy, loops, anastomoses, deltas, 
apical bifinities and trifinities. It's all fun stuff. And on our last case, we'll feature the Ferkel Canal, the three apical portals of exit on the mesial system, a couple on the distal. It all starts with access. If you want to get this kind of anatomy, you have to have an access that allows you to win. And if you're a basketball player, you got to play above the rim on these, okay? So here we go. Access concepts. You know, there's been a lot of discussions on minimally invasive endodontics and how that might influence access cavities. Again, the goal would be to balance this out because we have systems to treat. We got to maximize remaining dentin, but we still have to get in and be successful. So one idea that has been advocated in the last few years uh, related to minimally invasive is the so-called ninja access. The ninja access, of course, is just a smaller opening. It leaves the cornice, it leaves the roof in certain places. And the idea through a smaller opening, you can come down, get your files into these canals and begin to work. The question begs, what about residual pulp tissue? Can we actually get it out? That's a question. Uh, when we pack cases, we use sealer. What if sealer gets trapped up in these difficult areas? Sealer's been known in the ascetic zone to influence ascetics because it can discolor teeth. So if we slide this over and you look at the other perspective, you can see there's a lot of more attention in saving a lot of circumferential dentin. Um, we're going to talk about what these references mean related to the various accesses in just a moment. Now, there's another one that's been talked about. It's been reported in the Journal of Endodontics, the International Endodontic Journal, and even trade journals, and it's called the Orifice Directed Access. In this access, we basically leave the occlusal table alone, and we just make small little openings with appropriate size burrs to get in. This is even more concerning for me as a teacher because there's a lot of pulp tissue right in here, there's pulp tissue out in here. And, you know, we're going to talk in a little bit about these triangles of dentin. These triangles of dentin really influence everything. When we put a file in here without addressing the triangle of dentin, the handle will be off axis. And we'll talk about how to remove the triangle to upright the handle to get it more on axis. So these are considerations. Again, there's more articles, and we'll explain a little bit more about uh, these, these references, just so you know, they're not suggesting or supporting the accesses I'm showing you. They're actually showing negative things, iatrogenic events that are encouraged when we make a different kind of an access. So really, if you look at the very end game, uh, there's probably a lot of different kinds of accesses, but we can basically say there's the small one, the ninja, there's the orifice directed one, and the one I've been teaching for years is complete access. And in just a moment, we'll look at complete access even further because what you'll see in here is you got a tongue, okay? These are tongues. This is like a lip of dentin. This is another tongue, another lip of dentin, and that's what's deflecting our file off axis. So we're gonna really focus in on why complete access gives you a chance to see the floor anatomy, it allows you to find hidden orifices, aberrant orifices, previously missed orifices. How about that one? And then, of course, um, fractures. Fractures can come down these uh, axial walls, and they can get thinner and fainter as we get to the pulpal floor. So complete access gives us much more command at diagnosing fractures and their extent. So we can determine, is it really appropriate to proceed with endodontics on this particular patient at this moment. So I'd like to close with the access cavities by just saying I want to talk a little bit more about them. I think I've identified three commonly taught ones today and of course there's different uh, technologies that are involved in each one of these. So with that said, let's look at access from another viewpoint, another standpoint. Well, thanks for presenting the different access types. One thing regarding the ninja access, just the very name itself kind of sounds like you need to be highly skilled and that not everyone can do it. It sounds a little intimidating just that it's called the ninja access. But that said, we're gonna, on our show today, we're going to talk more about the controversies surrounding the different types of accesses. 
Um, one thing we're not going to talk so much about is just the step-by-step -step how to do radicular and coronal access. That will be a future show. Today we're going to mostly talk just about the controversies surrounding the different access preparations. So first of all, can you tell us what do you think is driving the different types of access cavities? Like, what is the motivation behind it? Oh, I'll be happy to. Um, really, what's driving all of this uh, is the words minimally invasive endodontics. Uh, it's a noble concept. It's a measureless dimension. It's more of a thought about maximizing uh, and preserving remaining dentin. So that's probably what's mostly behind it is just trying to maximize tooth structure. The thing is, uh, as we'll talk about uh, as we go along here, there's going to be some kind of a, a give and take. I'll let you use the word later <laughs> between uh, which size we decide to carve out. Well, what type of access do you prefer and why? Well, it's really easy. I prefer um, complete access because as a teacher for over 40 years, a practitioner closing in on 50 years, so with all this experience and seeing clinic, uh, clinicians around the world in workshop settings, when they uh, groups used to come around the world, as you know, to our office, and we watched them in two-day courses perform and do things, we noticed that everybody, endodontist and well-trained general dentist alike, always did significantly better when they opened the tooth up. Now, the access needs to be appropriate. It needs to be anatomically driven. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, not too big, not too small, just right. And of course, we can debate about that. Uh, what's too small, what's just right. But the thing is, when we have small access cavities, as I said earlier at the whiteboard, um, it's much harder for clinicians to find these orifices. Uh, they can't really see fractures down the axial walls and read their extent of propagation, especially the ones that start to go below the orifice a little bit. So we have visual problems here. As I mentioned, leaving large amounts of roof or inter-roof uh, between systems of mesial and distal roots, you can trap tissue post-treatment. Uh, we can see sealer in these areas. Sealers, a lot of them discolor with time, and in the ascetic zone with a high smile line, uh, teeth can discolor. So th these are just needless complications. And if we just focus on getting it off, uh, the, the roof, get the roof off, we're going to be able to look into these things, see the axial walls, see where the aberrant, hidden, and previously missed orifices were or are. And uh, it's just going to give you more control, more confidence. Looking ahead, uh, you want files just to slide effortlessly down these internal smooth axial walls right into orifices. You, looking ahead, you want your shaping files to come in unencumbered, not having coronal interferences. And then, of course, looking ahead to disinfection and filling root canal systems. What armamentarian are we planning to use? And can we get that armamentarian in there properly uh, based on the access? And I think you're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the inherent costs associated because you just can't go out and do this access and have really much success at all unless you have the appropriate technology. Most dentists around the world can do that kind of an access. Well, I know you just said something about the importance of removing coronal interferences. And um, what about triangles of dentin? I know that you advocate their removal, but some clinicians don't. And can you tell us more about that? Oh, great, because, you know, when we look at forcated teeth, the canals come into the pulp chamber at pretty much awkward angles. They don't just come up into the pulp chamber. They come and bend in coronally into the pulp chamber. So when colleagues start to come in to a canal without removing the triangle of dentin, you'll see the handle of the file frequently off axis. In fact, when I teach, I even say your assistant knows you're doing it wrong. <laughs> because she looks over and she goes, my God, the handle is way over here. How is he going to negotiate the recurvature deep? So uh, you want to get those triangles out because the canals, when they bend in, what I didn't emphasize, and we'll have graphics at another show, those canals anatomically before humankind has ever entered the tooth are closer to the furcal side concavity than the outer wall. So if we're looking at the mesial root under that molar, and we have a triangle of dentin that I showed at the whiteboard earlier, if we leave that triangle on, 
those canals are already closer to the furcal side, so as you drop a rock into a pond of water, you'll get concentric emanating circles. Well, that's what a rotary file does. It cuts blindly north wall, south wall, east, west wall. So the preparations drift and they get closer to furcal danger. And sometimes there's overt strip, uh, strip perforations. So people who don't want to remove them, they're pretty much like concerned about removing too much, too much tooth structure. So. You know, that's exactly it. They are focused on precious, I think it's been called precious cervical dentin. And on the outer wall, the opposite side of the frication, uh, they don't want that outer wall reduced at all. So what they're not appreciating is the canals are already not centered in the mesial distal dimensions of the root. The canals are a little off-centered because of the way that canals bend in abruptly into the pulp chamber coronally. So they're focusing on preserving the outer wall. I want to preserve the furcal wall because that's, from my experience over 40 years, that's where all the problems occur. Now, if you're thinking about fractured, if we learn to move that canal away from furcal danger, and we'll show that on another show and the right tools and all that, how to do it, but with a brushing motion, we can move the canal and we end up histologically with centered preparations between the mesial and distal aspect of the root. So if we think about that, that's a, a, a better result. That's a more endodontically strong tooth, and it's a tooth that's much likely to fracture over time. And of course, we'll talk about the restoration in just a minute. Okay, well, do you, are there any situations where, the, um, where a certain type of access would be contraindicated? Like, for example, uh, I think it was last, last show we talked about uh, a high incidence of torodontism in, when you were in China, and that's like the really deep access cavity, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had a really deep access cavity, maybe you wouldn't try a ninja access because that might be even two ninja. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm laughing because it's hysterical. You know, these people that draft up these clever schemes, listen, let me be kind. We have some really masterful clinicians and they have CBCT and they have oral scanners and they have microscopes, okay? So they can do these kinds of things and post a few cases and really a round of applause in a very authentic way here. The thing is, that's not what the masses have. I already said on another show, I think less than three or four percent of the, of the nations, U.S. nations, dentists use a microscope. Okay, so we're telling people to do things they don't have. And how many dentists are going to run out and buy a CBCT, go buy a microscope, an oral scanner, and those all have learning curves and prices attached to them. So as a teacher, when you go through Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, Southeast Asia, Japan, Russia, China, India, Europe, when you go anywhere in the world, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to address the anatomy of the human teeth. And so these can be done with high skill and technology. And I will say even to those colleagues, you're still making some compromises. You're still having some loose ends. And now if we think the masses are going to embrace this, uh, that's a good joke. It's not going to really happen in a serious way. So complete access really shouldn't be uh, terrifying. It's not a school of thought. It's not ruddle. It's not your dental school versus my dental school. It's anatomically driven. And so uh, where the orifices are is where they are. And really, there's been no articles that have ever shown leaving a cornice or part of the roof intact preserves tooth structure. Well, preserves tooth structure, but it doesn't make teeth stronger or weaker, stronger or weaker. Once you punch through the roof, that arc has been violated, and once you break the integrity of an arch, that's the strongest form in nature, um, taking the roof off and the soffit off is not a big deal. So maybe like certain types of anatomy might um imply that you should not do a certain access? Let or? me play off you a little bit better. Uh, yes, torodontism is really, uh, that's that really deep pulp chamber, maybe past, or definitely subcrestal, and probably uh, clusal table apices, probably about halfway down. So this is gonna be terribly compromising. Of course, there's other things we talked about last time in our anatomy and China discussions. We talked about intral Molaris, and we talked about radix paramolaris. So we have those two radix, little extra root 
uh, on the distal lingual, on the distal buccal of mandibular molars, it's going to be hard to find those even with CBCT. Uh, so getting things off helps us get the radix paramolaris, the radix intramolaris, the torrid onchism, and the C-shaped molar that we talked about. And then I would say uh, maybe if you have a brickadentin, uh, you have a significant calcification and mineralization, and maybe there's no observable pulp chamber or pulpal space on a well-angulated film, yeah, that's when we start to talk about uh, maybe small accesses that are guided with microscopes, CBCT, oral scanners, XNAV. Then we can stay right on the money and drill maybe to mid-root or maybe even deeper before we pick up a remnant of a canal that we can stick a file in and begin to slide it to length. I guess obviously if you were retreating a tooth, then ah! it would already be failing and maybe you need to see and, and get, like get inside the access cavity and see what's going on. <laughs> okay, so this is what I heard. What I heard is we'll do it really small and we'll hope it works. And when it works, we're thrilled and everybody's clapping. Look at that tooth saving device they did with those little punched holes. But what I really heard is when that fails, <laughs> Maybe it's time to see, and maybe it wouldn't hurt to see, and get in there and take a look, and are there some stain fractures? Uh, there was a great article in the Journal of Endodontics just recently that showed uh, extending, uh, when fractures extend subcrestal. And if you, like, I mean, two or three millimeters, uh, they were talking about packing it below that fracture. So here's the orifice. Fracture extends a little bit below the orifice. They were packing gutta percha from here down, but they were putting bonded materials up here, and that was saving the life of the tooth for several more years. So this all comes, though, with vision. And vision means, look, um, there, there's a lot of controversies here. There's no right or wrong. A lot of it just has to do with your training, the technology you have aboard, and experience. So you need, I, I heard you say a few times already that you need to have a lot of technology to be able to do these types of access mm -hmm. um, cavities. But I'm also wondering if you're doing this type of access, is it going to take a lot longer to do a root canal in a tooth than this one? Like I'm, if, I, if I'm a patient and I'm going to a, a dentist who's going to do a ninja access on me, can I pretty much expect it's going to take twice as long? I, I mean, I'm just Well, you gave that. me the book, so I'm going to remind you of what you gave me. Uh, it was uh, Glad, what's his name? Outliers, Malcolm? Malcolm Gladwell, yes. Okay, Malcolm Gladwell said probably if you've been trained up, we're not talking about a person on the street, but if you're trained up and you're a dentist, how many hours was it to find mastery? 10,000. It was 10,000 hours. So uh, you can have all the technology and the algorithms with your software to use XNAV, and you can uh, do guided access cavities, sleeve guides, all this stuff. We can talk about all that. The point is, it does take longer. Uh, it takes uh, a lot longer, especially with sleeve guides, because you have to make a 3D printed device uh, out of the operatory so you can bring it into play when the patient comes. XNAVs eliminate the sleeve guides, as we talked about in our China discussions, but the XNAV requires the technology you just mentioned. I've watched several live demos. I saw a guy start off with a uh, orifice directed access cavity. 15 minutes later, he said, Diamond, please. Diamond, come. Let's peel the walls back a little bit. Another 10 minutes went by, peeling it back. Finally, the joke I had with some of my friends that also saw it is at about 30 or 40 minutes, they had the access, <laughs> what I would call the complete access. And they said, now we're ready to work. And they were really excited. So they only showed this to get started and ended up over there each and every time because they couldn't see and they were struggling. So maybe if you did 10,000 hours of this, you would do it just as quickly. But my observations is it will take more, more time and it'll take time to even understand the technology and how to use it proficiently. You better get your staff trained up. Right. And there's cost associated with all this technology. And I also heard you say when you were lecturing about the concepts that your access will influence shaping, disinfection, and also obturation. So how would that influence? 
those things? Well, I won't mention names, but it's the other guy in Santa Barbara. But there's actually several guys in Santa Barbara that are endodontists, but it's one of the other guys. Yeah, it's one of the other guys. Mm -hmm. He was talking about this, publishing articles about this, doing it on live demos. So now we know who it is. But in a more recent uh, discussion on Doc Matters, he said, get rid of the pulpal roof. It's interfering with the agitation and movement of fluids. So it's actually a limited access is ruining the hydrodynamics of the $70,000 machine that is supposed to be agitating clean root canal systems. So he said, get the roofs off, completely de -roof. So you can see controversies are always ongoing. And then there's always, what was the word you had me uh, talk about? Uh, Something about controversies. They're sh they're shifting. They're they're changing always. We we move from one. Trending, con maybe? They're trending. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a a trend. You can do it. You publish it. Everybody goes. Yeah, we can now really embrace minimally invasive endodontics. Listen, it sounds like I'm a little harsh here on. Oh, I shouldn't hit my mic on minimally invasive endodontics. It's really noble in all sincerity, but you have to be smart. Balance. You know? That's the word I'm hearing without hearing specifically that word. I'm hearing that balance is needed. Like you need to still respect the concept of min minimally invasive endodontics, but at the same time not compromise the treatment objectives. Bingo. So if there was one thing that you would want a young dentist to take away from our show today, what do you think it would be? Okay. Cut an access cavity that is not based on your philosophy the school you went to or something you read. It should be based on anatomy. Say it after me three times. Anatomy. Anatomy. <laughs> anatomy. I think we heard it three times. So it's anatomically driven. That's number one. And two, if you're a brand new dentist, don't try to do something heroic. You know, do maybe 10,000 of those and really get used to holding teeth in your hands if you're a teacher and then your clinical work that uh, supports all that. And now you begin to have a library in your brain of every tooth that you're entering and you kind of know the anatomy and the variations and aberrations within that normal anatomy. So uh, make an access that you're comfortable with that you can actually do the subsequent steps that you referred to, shaping, cleaning, and filling. And uh, get comfortable and if you want to get a little smaller or, or a lot of times decay, we'll have caries, recurrent caries. Sometimes when we clean out caries, that's part of our pathway in that can we uh, that can be utilized to get tools into canals. Uh, Marco Martignoni in Italy wrote a nice paper. I think we're going to show some references later, but uh, in those references, or we'll show the references, it showed that a lot of times if you have big mesial blowout caries, you can actually de-excavate, get all that stuff out of there, and you have a good pathway already into the distal, and so you might have a modified complete access based on if there's existing carries. So that would be number one, be comfortable. Uh, number two, be sure to appreciate this word balance that you've been hearing because the, the main thing is you're trying to save this patient's too. So there's gotta be a balance between doing the right job and fulfilling the endodontic goals not a bad idea. And then looking ahead to the restorative effort, can the tooth be exquisitely restored? Speaking of restoratives, very little is talked about any of this. If you go talk to the prosthodontist in the country, that could be a guy like, uh, uh, there's some really respected ones. We have some in the Northwest, Coyce, John Coyce. We have, uh, I can't, Frank Spear. I have heard their lectures. I've asked them these questions. But we got to think about with all this adhesion dentistry, it's nice to think we're bonding, bonding, bonding. Still mechanics plays a huge role. And they talk about the importance of the circumferential ferrule. And that ferrule is, needs to be two to three millimeter collar circumferentially around the tooth. So when your casting goes over, your restorative, it's squeezing and holding that tooth together and giving you cuspal protection. Okay? So... You know, the ferrule isn't so important, Lisa, on the mesial and distal parts because teeth are lined up and even if you're a dentulist, the loads are buccal, lingual, and vertical. So work, jaw slides to work, balance, vertical loads, those loads are withheld and withstood if we have a circumferential ferrule. And the mesial and distal ferrule is not that important. It's the buccal, lingual ferrule that's critical. So back to triangles of dentin and put a circle around that. 
you would rather move the canal away from a thin frication and have it go to the outer wall if you have a ferrule. So restoration of the endodontically treated tooth is crucial. And then I guess uh, my last thing I would say is, and this is supposed to be a joke, so come on, get ready to laugh, please. Okay, so if we use a car engine analogy and our engine fails on the freeway of life, would it be more logical to just raise the engine compartment lid or should we try to repair the engine through the tailpipe? Yeah! And so that's the end of our segment on the controversy surrounding access. Hope you enjoyed it. So to close our show for today, we'd like to share with you some demotivators. And let me explain to you a little bit what these are. Uh, about a decade ago, I gave my dad this box of these cards that are called demotivators. And on every card is like an inspirational picture and then a word. On this one, it says motivation and then a little saying. And some people might think it's negative but it's kind of humorous and funny, and it, but there's parts of it that actually ring true. So I'm gonna read one, and then my dad is gonna to explain to you what that means to him. Okay, so here's the first one. It's called motivation. If a pretty poster and a cute saying are all it takes to motivate you, you probably have a very easy job, the kind robots will be doing soon. Oh, okay, well, what that means to me is, uh in a dental environment is looking at a post-operative x-ray. So we've all seen a post-operative x-ray and they can spark a range of emotions from despair to exhilaration. Uh, we can see the very good, we can see the very bad, we can see flirts with the masterful, but uh, the films are just that, they're the films and they're a representation of the performance that's been given. So what I'm a little concerned about when I see some of these younger dentists thinking technology has the solution for everything and they forget the comment, fundamentals win it. Uh, technology should be an adjunct, okay? You still have to have a skill, like for example, carrying a small stainless steel file and getting it predictably Monday, Tuesdays, AMs and PMs, it's always going to length each time, every time, all the time. So we shouldn't expect a Ruby Goldberg machine to overcome deficiencies in primary training. Okay, so basically is what I'm hearing is you need to motivate yourself to be a skilled clinician so that you're needed so <laughs> robots won't be doing your job. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you've probably heard me say, but there's an old model, uh, you know, the shopping mall in the US. Uh, so we have the itinerant dentist shopping from mall to mall seeking his stall. Uh, these are more like robotic production clinics and they're not that fun to work in. There's not a lot of inspiration that one gets out of it. And yes, a lot of technology can replace mediocrity. If you're just doing mediocre stuff, uh, it's pretty easy to get replaced. If you want to be harder to replace, become a master. Be exceptional. Yeah. Okay, let's look at another one. Oh. Okay, this one is called Get to Work. And it says, you aren't being paid to believe in the power of your dreams. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what's missing in almost everything is effort. So <clears throat> we all have ideas, we all have hopes, we all have aspirations, right? Yeah, but you know what? Do we act on that? So if we don't act on it, it's just a hope, it's just an aspiration, it's just another idea. So maybe you should get a conversation going. Uh, conversations can get refined. I talk to you a lot about things we're doing, creative things, and it gets refined, it gets honed, it's like clay, it gets shaped, it gets pulled up. And so through a conversation, you develop an action plan. And if you have an action plan, that'll give you the result. So in life, if you don't like your results, change your approach. Just like the hand, there's two sides, break down, turn those breakdowns into breakthroughs. Okay, so that will be it for today. We'll leave you now so you can get to work, and we'll see you next time on The Rel Show. And get to work. <laughs> <laughs>